thank you very much, everybody. Um, my name is Penny Bickle. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a lecturer at the University of York, and I have been since September 2014. Um, and I am currently the module leader for our theory module, History and Theory. Um, so I've taught it twice, although I've been module leader for three years. And that's because of the realities of higher education is that I went on research leave for a year and someone else came in. The other reality of higher education is that when I took it on, I took it on as an already defined module with PowerPoint presentations that came from lots of different people. It was team taught and I was kind of giving it to when I arrived here, teach this, and you kind of, you're overwhelmed, you've got loads of stuff that you're getting used to and you just kind of go through, um, go through the process of, of teaching it. Um, and then the other reality of higher education, teaching higher education, is that I've just won a grant. So I came to you today to talk about how I was going to redesign history and theory. I've tinkered with it a little bit over the last three years, and I was, I've, you know, I've actually come to the point where I'm ready to put in a much different, not a different structure, but to put together things that I feel reflect me as a researcher a little bit better, which helps me teach it a lot more enthusiastically. Um, only now I've won the grant and I probably won't teach it again for another three years. Which means that the course that... Um, uh, that I've, I've kind of handed on to someone else will probably be tinkered with a little bit and then it will come back to me and we'll see what life is like in 2020 and what position I'm in and how much time I actually have to redesign the history and theory module again. Then, so that's kind of uh, the realities of it but um, I want to talk a little bit about some of my ideals I guess about teaching theory and um, the point I wanted to make at the beginning is that I absolutely loved my theory module when I to quit as an undergraduate. It was the second year in my degree. It was taught by John Barrett and Mike Parker Pearson. And it was the thing that made me fall in love with archaeology and why I'm standing here today, I think. Right, so the next one. Um, so there are two sort of broad themes that my engagement with teaching history and theories really brought to me from my experiences at York. Um, and so I sort of want to raise them today as points for discussion, things to think about. The first one is teaching theory in the first year. Is there special things that we need to think about? Are there are certain ways in which we need to engage students um, uh, when we're doing it at that particular point at the beginning of their education in archaeology. And then I want to reflect a little bit as well, or for us to reflect a little bit as well, about whether there have been changes over, say, the last nearly 20 years since I took my undergraduate theory course that are interesting for us to reflect on as a discipline and think about how are we incorporating this into how we think about our own discipline um, and our own approaches to theory. Oh, sorry, I'm clicking the mouse off. Okay, so to start, um, just to give you a sort of overview of history and theory, the module, um, theory module at York, it's taught in the first year in the spring term, so it comes after a term of a learning within archaeology. It's uh, embedded within teaching the history of the discipline. So the idea is that it blends together both the history of archaeological thought and the newer perspectives that are coming in. It's taught through a mixture of <coughs> lectures and seminars. So um, academic members of staff, permanent members of staff, those are lucky of us, those of us lucky enough to have jobs, teach the lectures, and then GTAs, PhD students, um, and associate lecturers teach the seminars. Before I arrived at York, um, and, and it was set up, I think, as a module that was team taught, and that was very embedded within our first year overall, that all the modules tended to be team taught, so the lecturers that came in came to talk to their specific specialism, they came in and put in a sort of impassioned uh, lecture or debate um, from their particular perspective, and then that was contextualised within the seminars, and then um, it was sort of felt that there was poor attendance, perhaps as a result of that, but also a complete timetabling nightmare in which you would be doing post-processionalism one week and then processionalism the next, as you had to fit it in with very busy staff timetables. Um, and it also meant that one year the seminars didn't quite match up with what the lectures were because someone forgot to update the website. Um, but So I, I kind of went back through, and I think in 2013 they were looking at an average of 35 out of 75 students attending and it was felt I think that if it was taught by one person there might be more of a kind of route through the course um, that people would be able to keep hold of. Um, so there had been some other sort of attempts to engage students and to think about theory in more creative and additional ways. So since the module was designed they'd introduced these field trips 
um, which was a response to student feedback to say that they hadn't really, hadn't really got an opportunity to apply the theories that they were learning, they were self-guided, um, they were sort of optional, and I think students, when I look back over the feedback, very much responded to what the GTA teachers were responding to the field trips. I think they're a fantastic idea and have worked on them since to try and make them more engaging for students in a much bigger part of the module, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the important thing about the module was that it was the beginning of the theory. It was going to be continued in the second year through a module called Themes, which is either themes in prehistory or themes in historical archaeology taught across our second year. That, again, is team talk. People come in and talk to a particular period, and um, they tend to approach it from particular thematic perspectives, so power, ideology, landscape, symbolism, and then the amount of theory <coughs> embedded within that particular course then varies, of course, on individual members of staff's <coughs> interests in particular theories or not. So it, it, whether the terminology that we're creating in the first year is really then embedded into that second year so that that link is created, I think, could be um, debated. So, the redesign. Um, our, when I sort of said, oh, yeah, I think this is, I'd like to, re I would like to redesign this, um, I wasn't allowed to go back to the drawing board. Um, the way that the first year is set up is that we have to hit certain numbers of credits, which means there are a certain number of hours that have to be taught, and that things are structured within a timetable that if I wanted to play around with too much, I'd cause such a knock-on effect with other modules, I wasn't able to change. So I was sort of left with the structure of the module, which was 16 one-hour lectures, 15 one-hour seminars, these six um, one-hour guide, self-guided field trips, and then a formative assessment and a summative assessment. So I couldn't go completely back to the drawing board and redesign it. I had that structure in place. Um, so, but what I was free to sort of change and <coughs> think about were the content of those lectures and seminars and field trips. I was said, well, you can redesign the assessment if you like, but it still has to be marked by the GTAs in this certain way. And um, as long as it's that kind of coursework style, you can't give multiple pieces of work. It has to be within those particular dates. But, and if you've ever been to one of these, um, we call it PG CAP in York, your training to become academic lecturer, the importance of, oh, you could use your virtual learning environment. <laughs> um, thank you for that. That's really useful. Um, so, uh, so what I did was I started to look back at the feedback that we've had previous years, from the year I taught it and then from um, the years previous um, to how that, that we, we kept. I also started to talk to colleagues about how we could build, we build this module um, within sort of the structure of the degree, what, what should I be really sort of teaching in order to support what comes next in themes. And I went to talk to colleagues and they co I'd come away with a list of things that they would be like, oh, well, it would be great if you could teach this and this and this and this, and then I go to my next <coughs> colleague and go, oh yeah, redesigning history and theory, what do you think? Well, for themes, I'd really like you to teach this, this and this. And then by the time I'd done that several times, I had a massive list of all the different theories and themes that, that were sort of considered required to be cover covered. You know, this subject, this particular subject, absolutely has to be taught. This case study, it's absolutely essential. And obviously there was nothing really I could do with that because I couldn't squeeze it <coughs> into the, the time that I had. I felt like I had to take a step back. Um, and I sort of began to realise that if I was just meddling with what the content was, I wasn't really engaging with any of the problems that the module had had or any of the poor feedback or the student feedback or, or the attendance. What I was doing was just kind of changing the surface, um, the ideas on the surface. It was still being taught in the same way. The students were still being instructed to kind of be treated in the same way. So I wanted to kind of sort of go back to the beginning and think about what I was doing um, and, and sort of the position that I was taking in relationship to theory um, as I was beginning to change the module. And the first thing I wanted to do then um, was to think about the module's position in the first year. And I don't know, this is what I see first years is like. That <laughs> <laughs> probably says more about me than them, that you know, you're sitting in like this big wide eyes looking at you. Um, uh, and so uh, what I did was um, talk to colleagues and they said, well, this is where we teach the key concepts. This is where cultural history is taught. This is where post-processionalism is taught. And we, you need to, need to cover that. But other than that, um, 
you know, really what, what are the concerns that you're bringing up. So some people I spoke to said there aren't any. You shouldn't really be thinking about first years as any different from second or third years. And I kind of agree with some of the points that staff made with that we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of giving students challenges. We shouldn't be scared of sort of taking them really into the, the depth of ideas. But I do think there are areas that we kind of, you do want to think about and be sensitive to in the first year. The first one is that there really isn't any prior experience of learning in archaeology. So a lot of it is unfamiliar and it's the first time you're coming to a lot of things. Um, and uh, uh, when I was doing PGCAP, I loved finding articles that kind of took the kind of tenets that people felt as being the absolute golden truth that you needed to encourage deep learning rather than surface learning um, and finding articles that really challenged that and, and loving them so much. So this is Donaldson and Penn Edwards um, working in uh, the Aust con Australian context um, and they challenge that, that they say it's a false dichotomy to oppose deep learning and surface learning. Students need to cycle between the two or use them both simultaneously in order to build both, both the breadth so you have the context for the depth. In order to sort of facilitate that depth, you've got to get that broad overview, you've got to have those surface moments where you're kind of paddling around, if you like, before you take those lunges and sort of um, diving off into, into the depth. Um, disciplinary knowledge is still growing, and that means that vocabulary is, is getting more familiar, but it's, it's still a challenge to overcome. And I think when things are new, it is just takes that little bit extra energy and effort to, to get them on board. And, and critical thinking is still in the beginning <coughs> stages, so developing that sense of what criticism is and how it works is still beginning to, to be evolved. And then um, something that I found absolutely fascinating, or a paper I found absolutely fascinating, Stanley and Manthorpe, um, working in the medical sciences um, in 2001, were talking about, uh, they were working with students becoming doctors, um, and, and sort of talking to them about the experiences they were having with not necessarily a theory module, but a social and cultural practice module um, and how it reflected on their practice um, as, uh, 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 as potential doctors. And they made the point that the identities that those students had were still forming. They were still under beginning to understand themselves um, as university students, what that meant to them and what that meant to their identity was still in the process of being negotiated. I'd probably argue that's always being negotiated, but it was new at that point. They were beginning to explore it. And the point they made back in 2001 was that there's a lot of tension that students have to negotiate between, on the one hand, being told that they're consumers, so the fees have you know, <coughs> come in at this point, and there was like, they're beginning to think of themselves as consumers and there's a lot of pressure on them from outside influences to say you're there to consume. But on the other hand, the lecturers are standing at the front to saying um, you're not, you're here to think for yourselves. And, and kind of the clash of that was causing a lot of sort of tension and uncomfortability of how students were approaching some of those social and cultural questions that they were learning as medical students. I found that to be an absolutely fascinating statement. And I have found thinking about the identity of the students I'm teaching, how they're coming to understand themselves as they go from uh, school students to university students to, to, to that kind of critical thinking has been very useful, at least for me, for thinking through those ideas. So, um, I remain absolutely committed then to teaching theory in year one, um, but doing it for very specific reasons. The first is to engage uh, students in disciplinary debate. So to get them to see the discipline not as something that's absolutely fixed that they're here to learn, but as something they're here to debate and <coughs> contribute to that debate. The second thing is to challenge that archaeology, and I mean archaeology here, not theory, is disconnected from sort of a, a real-world idea, and then theory is disconnected from real archaeology. So two things there. One, that archaeology doesn't sort of contribute to our modern lives, and secondly, that theory doesn't contribute to archaeology. And then also to refine students' understanding of the process of learning and seeing that sort of as a cultural practice in itself, a social cultural practice. Um, and one of the things I found really interesting, um, I looked at the QAA statement um, for my PG cap, and it was updated in 2014. And at that point, um, they, you made a change from self-reflection being repeated throughout the um, QAA statement to self-reflexive practice. And I find that sort of insertion of practice being 
is very, very interesting. Um, so, uh, um, oh, only five minutes left. Damn. Uh, <laughs> so, I find that very interesting because we have students definitely do, and we have a tendency when we set up degrees to see the practical classes as very different from the sort of more theory classes. And that kind of instrumental division between the two, between practice and theory, um, I think filters through to students so that they tend to view the theory module as one of the passive modules where, the, where, the, where the, when you go into a practical module what you're doing is practice. And I think one of the reasons that when staff do get positive feedback for theory and they are enthusiastic, it's not just because of their enthusiasm, it's because they see themselves as practitioners of theory, so they're able to show how it's applied. Um, and that comes from, comes from my understanding of Bourdieu. And things like, you know, taking in drawing is the example I've used here, where as an academic, when I'm talking about drawing artefacts, I know it's a process of interpretation. I know it's about detail, close understanding of that object and, and how it's created. But I don't always make those links between those two things when I'm standing in front of students. So this is kind of the redesign um, that I've... I proposed and has been passed, and it sort of brings together the kind of the ideas, the understanding I have of what it means to practice archaeology, um, the, the kind of being sensitive to this idea that there is identity change going on with us as students, and I want them to engage in self reflexive practice on those um, identities, and also thinking about this sort of a first year module. So, what I've tried to do is to um, take them through in the first sort of half of the course the history of archaeological theory and then bring some of the same ideas and case studies that are raised in the first half back and debate them in the second half. So doing things like using Star Car and Sutton Who, which are very close to the sort of York's heart, um, to allow, allow those links and discussions to be made and also to then more strongly structure the seminars and the field trips. And what I found is the more I structure what I ask students to do, the more space they actually seem to have to be creative. So the more certain they know what's being asked of them, the more they're able to take those ideas um, and then develop them. And so the idea is we cover some of the different viewpoints and then we look at how those viewpoints have explored different ideas in the second half. And then taking the field trips, which if I look back over sort of five years of feedback, have had really poor, poor feedback. Students really haven't engaged with them. Um, so my response to that is not to take them out of the module, but to redesign them and sort of put them in in a much more stronger way and make them part of the formative assessment. Um, so this is an example of one of them, the archaeology of my room. What we do, what I'm going to do is set them extracts of Danny Miller's Comfort of Things to read very specific abstracts, uh, excerpts, which are then discussed within the seminar in relation to certain artefacts or objects from students' rooms. So, how long have I got left? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things was that I, had, I wanted to raise the discussion, because I, I don't know that I've still got to the bottom of why it caused so much upset, was I had very strong reaction to putting the, the, the kind of history of theory back into the course, um, both positive and negative from uh, from colleagues when I sort of proposed it. Um, there were some sort of criticisms that it was a very Eurocentric approach to take to archaeology, um, and that it was going to make uh, students harder to see some of the connections in time. But on the other hand, there were some very positive sort of responses to that um, uh, when, when I proposed the, the redesign. Um, so, so I wanted to end really by thinking about um, how practice perhaps in teaching archaeological theory has changed and, and, and if it's changed. And I really love this picture because it kind of sums up for me what I think is actually going in a lot on, inside a lot of student heads. I think Matthew captured that very nicely. The kind of diversity of ideas that, that they're trying to explore and trying to, to filter through. And I think when I took an undergraduate theory module, it was very much defending itself and its position in the curriculum. A lot of the, the lectures that we had, they were fantastic, they were very passionate, they were great explorations, but they were defending theory as a subject. And I think what we're trying to do now is we've not got to defend theory to our colleagues, 
So we can begin to explore different ways of putting theory of practice into, um, into the modules that we're teaching. Um, so for me, I, uh, I like to try and understand uh, the ways in which we think about difference and different ideas through one of my um, favourite um, philosophers, Rosie Bray Dotty, who's a feminist philosopher, and she talks about nomadism, um, which she's uh, developing ideas from Deleuze. Um, and for me, uh, this idea about nomadism is about allowing students to take up different positions and try them out and be nomads through the different theories and through the different courses. So, by way of conclusions, um, sorry, I, I sped through that last bit. Um, what I wanted to kind of, sort of <coughs> propose today is that I think <coughs> when I took um, history, when well, I took theory as an undergraduate, it was very much seen as a rite of passage. So it was something that you jumped over in your second year. It was a liminal zone when you went away from <laughs> the main kind of practice of archaeology. And then once you'd come through the theory module, the other side, you were reincorporated um, as, a, as, a, <laughs> as an uh, archaeologist. So I kind of want to take away that kind of view of theory um, from my course um, and see it more as the start of a conversation and a debate that students are going to have and going to come back to time and time again as they go through the course. So, um, and then two points, I just kind of, as I've come across uh, and been redesigning this course, things that have been raised to me, are sort of interesting discussion points. One is about how, you know, where the theory should be and how we teach theory alongside um, disciplinary history. Um, and the other one is uh, whether people agree with me that we should start to see encouraging students and sort of being open about how we see theory as part of the practice of archaeology and encouraging them to engage with it as a practice rather than as something they sit in the lecture theatre and passively learn. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>